Welcome to what I call a rabbit trail Bible study of Daniel chapter 7. We'll start off with the name Daniel itself. The name Dan means judge. Way back in Genesis 49:16, when Jacob was prophesying over his sons, we find that Dan was to be a judge. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. And the most famous judge coming out of the tribe of Dan was Samson. The E-L ending on the name is from the Hebrew word Elohim, which means God. So the name Daniel means God is judge or God has judged. Now we Christians recognize that Daniel is indeed a prophet, and so he belongs in the prophet category. For example, we wouldn't get the book of Daniel mixed up with the Psalms or Proverbs, but it seems as if the Jews kind of did. The Jews divided their Bible into three sections, the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms, which they call Writings. Even Jesus refers to this in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, when he mentions the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. In the Jewish Bible, they have placed the book of Daniel in the Writings section, where you find the Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, and so on and so on. Not that this is wrong, it's just the way they did things. As you can see, here it is near the end of the Hebrew Bible. By comparison, in our English Bible, we've placed Daniel in the middle of the prophets. And we can do that because as Christians, we became priests, and the priests were the custodians of Scripture, just like the Levites were custodians of the Scriptures back in the Old Testament. One of the reasons the Jews didn't know what to do with the book of Daniel is probably because its primary subject is Gentiles. And let's face it, the Jews aren't exactly interested in Gentiles. And it's the Gentiles that are the focus of this book. This book is filled with Babylonians, Medes and Persians, Greeks, Romans, and a whole lot more. And to top it all off, Daniel chapter 2 through chapter 7 isn't even written in Hebrew. It was written in Syriac, so it probably wasn't their favorite book. And now the so-called scholars step forward and bellyache, saying that the book of Daniel couldn't possibly be written by Daniel himself because it's way too accurate. Yes, that is their complaint. Anything but believe the Bible. But let's get started. God had been warning the Jews that he was going to allow them to be invaded. This always confused Israel because they couldn't understand why God would bless some heathen Gentile nations and use them to punish Israel. And sure enough, around 606 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar shows up. And over a series of years and a few campaigns, he takes a bunch of people captive. And of course, Daniel is one of the captives taken back to Babylon. It's at this point that the Charismatics on television get all excited. This book is full of incredible prophecy and good devotional material, and yet the only thing they can get excited about is convincing you that you need to start eating the same kinds of food that Daniel ate. But this study will concentrate on other things. For example, the Babylonian Empire was allowed to rise up because God allowed them to. And I'm sure the Babylonian people thought it was because they were somehow special or superior to other people in the world. But ever since the Babylonians, numerous Gentile nations have risen up, and they all thought it was because they were special, when in fact it was usually because God wanted to use them to punish Israel. A side note about King Nebuchadnezzar, he found where the old Tower of Babel was, and he posted a monument talking about it. The inscription says, the most ancient monument of Babylon, I built and finished it. Then Nebuchadnezzar refers to Nimrod, without mentioning him by name. A former king built it, but he did not complete its head. And so Nebuchadnezzar covered what he found with gold and put his name on it. Of course, we Bible believers know it was started by Nimrod, as recorded in the book of Genesis. And it's interesting that here, over a thousand years later, Nebuchadnezzar finds it and sets up what we would call memorial markers. And of course, most of the regular studies of the book of Daniel will tell you the basics that you need to know. That Nebuchadnezzar was troubled by a dream that God gave to him, 
And in the dream he saw a huge idol that was made up of different metals. The head was made of gold, and the chest and arms were made of silver, and so on and so on. And of course, God let Daniel know the meaning of the dream, and he told Nebuchadnezzar, and the prophecies of Daniel came true. And years later, Babylon was invaded by Persia. Then Persia fell to the Greeks, and then the Greeks fell to the Roman Empire. And we will now do some fast forwarding. Later on, Daniel's three friends find themselves in the fiery furnace, and the good Lord protects them. And, of course, the scholars can't handle this subject either. They can't imagine that it was an early appearance of our Lord in the fire instead of an ordinary angel. It's amazing how well-respected the scholars are, and yet they can't seem to handle anything important or controversial. They must have the cushiest jobs in the world, and yet they still bruise easily. And, of course, God warns King Nebuchadnezzar about not being too proud and boastful, but the king doesn't change, and God takes away his mental reasoning, and he goes around thinking like an animal and eats grass for seven years. These are all extremely important subjects in the Bible, and I hate to run right past them, but any regular study of Daniel will highlight these subjects fairly well. And many great artists have undertook to show the details of Daniel chapter 2, on down to the ten toes, which will be the future Antichrist world government. But when we get to Daniel chapter 7, and we find four strange beasts rising up out of the sea, these Bible teachers that were doing a fairly good job in Daniel chapter 2, unfortunately make a mistake on misapplying these beasts. They say to themselves, oh look, God is repeating himself. And so they just match up each of these four beasts with the main four sections of the idol from Daniel chapter 2. But in this Bible study, we will deviate from the standard teaching. From time to time, you may have seen beautiful charts like this drawn by the late great Clarence Larkin back in 1918. His charts are good because he draws them like a timeline, so you can see how each empire unfolds. But even Clarence Larkin will match up the lion with Babylon, and he'll match up the bear with the Persian Empire, the leopard with the Greek Empire, and the dragon with the Roman Empire leading into the Ten Toes. This seems to be the standard teaching among many of the brethren. Matthew Henry, R.C. Sproul, Adam Clark, J. Vernon McGee, C.I. Schofield, and John Wesley. They all match up Daniel chapter 7 with chapter 2. And I wouldn't blame them for doing that, as it would make sense if it weren't for one tiny little detail. And yes, you can almost understand why they do it. They'll even say, oh look, we found some lions etched into the walls of Babylon. You see, those Babylonians identified with the lion. And while that might seem important at first, we also find bulls. Did they identify with bulls as well? And we also find big lizards. Kind of like some sort of Komodo dragon that was alive and well back then. They probably loved that Babylonian heat and sunshine. But the great commentators and the study Bibles seem to be overlooking a minor detail in verse 17. You see, they all made up their minds about these beasts before they even got to verse 17. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Shall arise. That means they haven't risen up just yet when Daniel saw this vision. And when exactly did Daniel have this vision? In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. That's towards the tail end of the Babylonian empire. So that first beast that looks like a lion can't be Babylon. Because Babylon is already there. So if someone wants to align these beasts up with something, they can't start with Babylon. Babylon was already there, so they'd have to start with Persia if they were going to make an attempt at matching them up with anything. But what if this lion is not Persia either? Let's look at chapter 7's description. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked. And it was lifted up from the earth, 
and made stand upon the feet as a man. And a man's heart was given to it. Now, if we weren't reading the book of Daniel and we were instead just talking about countries being identified with certain animals, and I said, name the first country that comes into your mind that's usually thought of and identified as a lion, what country would you say? Just let it come to you naturally. When I asked the same question to a few of my friends without telling them about the book of Daniel, most of them quite naturally came up with England. I didn't tell them to think about the Bible beforehand. This is why the majority of those that I asked said England. Had I told them to think of an answer through a biblical mindset, they probably would have said something else. And that's because a lot of us have been preconditioned to not think of any modern countries when dealing with Old Testament prophecy. Here's an even easier one. Name a country that you associate with a bear. When I asked that question, I had even better success with nearly 100% of those that I asked. They came up with the answer of Russia. And many Russians probably would have preferred to have been associated with an eagle or some other animal, but over the years, other countries have labeled Russia with that association. In Russia's history, they had a leader named Ivan the Terrible, who had a man sewn up in a bear skin and then hunted by dogs. Ivan would also feed people to bears, and Russia has been well known for many years for training bears to perform in a circus. The second beast in Daniel chapter 7 shows up, and behold, Another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. Arise, devour much flesh. And over the years, they certainly have killed millions. And although I've been showing modern era editorial cartoons to show how the world used Russia as a bear, these kinds of ideas go back many years. These editorial cartoons are from the 1800s, and they show England as a lion and Russia as a bear. In this cartoon, they show England and Russia demanding that Turkey choose sides of who they want to be allied with. Here's the Russian bear going into Afghanistan and getting too close to India in the year 1885. And as you can see, that made England nervous because England owned India. It seems like for a couple of hundred years, these two have had a love-hate relationship, each one trying to be the world power. These last two cartoons have depicted Persia as being a cat, not a lion. But Persia and England do have something in common. They both allowed the Jews to return to their homeland. Cyrus the Great was the Persian king who allowed the Jews to go back to their homeland after the Persians had defeated the Babylonians. You can read all about it in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. It's also worth noting that at the end of World War I, under the Balfour Declaration, England allowed the Jews to have the land back in Israel because the British had control over the Middle East at that time. Of course, Yasser Arafat's uncle made a big fuss about it, So it became a big mess, and England went back on their promise. Since I briefly mentioned Persia a moment ago, let's go ahead and identify them. In Daniel chapter 8, the Bible refers to Persia as a ram, not a lion. Persia the ram gets attacked by the Greeks, and the Greeks are depicted as a goat. This will be Alexander the Great in history. You can read all about the ram and the goat in Daniel chapter 8. Since both of these countries are identified for us, there was never any reason to match them up with lions and bears. So I will say that the lion is England. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 4, it says, And a man's heart was given to it. When God plucked the wings off of England, many of them had already started becoming evolutionists. The same could be said of Germany. And yet the Germans would take evolution to the extreme. Evolution teaches that since we all came from worms and animals, then it must be okay to exterminate entire groups of people, as we found out from the atrocities of World War II. But as messed up as England can get with evolution, 
they couldn't have taken things to the same extreme that Germany did. They have a heart. And speaking of heart, who could forget King Richard the Lionhearted? Here he is hanging out with Errol Flynn. But seriously, this lion did have wings. And if you have wings, you can cover a lot of territory. And at one time, England covered a lot of territory. You've heard the old slogan, the sun never sets on the British Empire. They had wings. God allowed them to spread out because it's always been God that allows countries to rise up. And then over time, something happened to the British Empire. Why did they get their wings plucked? It's almost as if they tossed aside the greatest work of English literature and went for something called the Revised Version in 1885. This was the start of the downfall. Now remember the Balfour Declaration I mentioned earlier of 1917? Well, the British failed to live up to their promises to the Jews, and instead they bowed to the demands of Yasser Arafat's uncle in 1921, and a young Winston Churchill gave the Arabs Transjordan instead. And that's probably what sealed the deal in the great lion getting its wings plucked off. And slowly but surely, Great Britain wasn't so great anymore. They soon lost control of India, Hong Kong, South Africa. And I'd keep going, but you get the idea. England since then has had to get some help every now and then from a distant relative. A third mega power has arisen. And just as a leopard is in the same big cat family, and these two cats can reproduce, the third beast arises out of the water. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Now the striking difference between these two cats is, this leopard has wings, but its wings are the wings of a chicken. Not like in England's case, where it had the wings of an eagle. The United States can fly, but it has to work harder than England ever had to. The United States fought in Korea and Vietnam, and yet what did they have to show for it? They fought in Desert Storm, and what did they have to show for it? Don't get me wrong if you're watching this and you fought in one of those wars, then God bless you. I'm just trying to take a little inventory. Basically, the United States does what England asked them to do. This picture is the famous photograph of the big three megapowers meeting at Yalta near the end of World War II, and the world is still dealing with decisions that were made by these three. When God talks about his son, he compares him to a lamb without spot or blemish. The exact opposite kind of animal would be a leopard. A leopard has a white belly and black spots, but he's mostly yellow-brown. He's truly an integrated animal. You might even say he's a melting pot, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast also had four heads, which is interesting because the United States doesn't have a king. Its government is divided up with two houses of Congress and an executive branch and a judicial branch. And it wouldn't surprise me if one day they added District of Columbia and Puerto Rico as states. That would give them 52 states, which would divide up neatly into four suits. And now we move on to the fourth beast. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. This fourth beast really had an impact on Daniel. Comparing scripture with scripture, we see a similar creature with ten horns in Revelation chapter 12. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. This is why a lot of artists will draw the fourth beast as a red dragon. They are merely comparing Daniel with Revelation. This red dragon is the devil in Revelation, and yet here in Daniel, this fourth beast seems to be a kingdom, so this beast comes under the full control of the devil. And this ten-horned beast is mentioned again, this time in Revelation 13. 
And I stood upon the sands of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. This last beast system has parts of the previous three beasts. It's integrated, kind of like the United Nations. The mouth of the lion might indicate that English is the primary language spoken, and the feet like a bear could mean that it moves around like Russia. In the past, China and Russia have had military alliances. Now, I'm not ruling China out as far as being a major player in the grand scheme of things. And they certainly have been identified as a dragon, just as certainly as Russia has been identified as a bear. But the dragon is the devil that is moving and manipulating this final beast. And this final beast is made up of parts of previous kingdoms. Daniel doesn't use the word dragon to describe this fourth beast. And yet John mentions the dragon in Revelation. This red dragon will have a huge obsession. It will be obsessed with destroying Israel. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, and times, and half a time, from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Now, as strange as that seems, you have to admit that the entire subject matter is strange, and yet it reminds us of something. It reminds us of a strange verse in the book of Job. In describing the behemoth, God mentions that when it drinks, it thinks it can drink up the Jordan River. Behold, he drinketh up a river, and hasteth not. He trusteth that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth. Now, I do believe that the behemoth was something Job saw, and I do think it was the biggest animal on the planet. I also realize that God can be talking about the devil at the same time. The word behemoth means all kinds of animals. Even though we were given a very descriptive list of characteristics, this creature back in Revelation and the book of Daniel seems to be a combination of animals. And that's the way the devil likes to work. He likes to get all kinds of things together. He will get the nations together again, and they will worship him. One more note about the leopard, lion, and bear. We find another strange combination of these animals in 1 Samuel chapter 17. This is when David is trying to convince King Saul to let him take on Goliath. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. Now you'll notice that there were three creatures mentioned by David. You saw two of them, but the leopard was missing. So the uncircumcised Philistine must be the leopard. And Goliath is a type of Antichrist, who also defies the armies of God. And the Antichrist will want to put a mark on you. Sometimes men in the Bible are likened to trees. These three beasts seem to have something in common. They all rear up on their hind legs and make marks in trees about eye level. But I've probably taken this rabbit trail too far for some of you. At least I've given you something to think about. And that's how to have a successful rabbit trail. This may not be your preferred way to study the Bible, but many times the Bible seems to cover all kinds of subjects at once. Don't be afraid to take off on a trail. Now, before you try and argue with me in the comments below, and if you do, that's okay, I'll say this here and now that I could be wrong about England, Russia, and the United States. The point was, you can't force chapter 7 to equal chapter 2. Now, your mileage may vary. Hopefully, I've given you some good starting points to do your own study. And you have everything you need to keep this study going. Sure, the bookstores are filled with many study Bibles and commentaries. 
and they all have a stated goal to help you understand the Bible more. But they might not address the most important part, you humbling yourself before God and His Word. Many times that gets overlooked. All you have to do is say, Lord, I know your word is perfect. Now show me where you want it to take me. Do you think the know-it-all scholars ever say anything like that?